Today, I have a knitting tale like no other to share with you. I'm gonna take you on a journey of my wildest creation, what I'm wearing right now, this epic Nancy Drew themed sweater. Buckle up for story time as I tell you how I crafted this one of a kind masterpiece, which is my Rhinebeck sweater for the New York Sheep and Wool Festival the year that I knit it. Maybe it'll give you some ideas too if you'd like to design your own Intarsia sweater. So, in July 2017, I hatched an idea for the most epic project I have ever entertained before or since and set off to knit probably the best thing I have ever made in my life. It started with an idea to knit an intarsia sweater that was similar to the illustration style intarsia sweaters of the 1940s and 50s and designing it for myself. Those were often for little boys with themes like Hopalong Cassidy and Roy Rogers, although there were sometimes adult versions too. Those sweaters were machine knit, so they weren't knit by hand. Even though intarsia was fairly common for knitting patterns at the time for novelty patterns, it was often somewhat on a smaller scale using a finer gauge yarn or if it was on a larger scale, it used a thicker yarn and had less detail. But another distinguishing feature of those vintage machine knit sweaters that I was inspired by was that they often, although not always, had a limited color palette. Sometimes they used just a background color and one or two contrast colors, and many of them also had contrasting ribbing around the hems, cuffs, and neckband. I didn't have a theme yet when I started, but I knew that I wanted to roughly emulate that basic look, a limited color palette and contrasting ribbing. And here's the kicker about gauge of yarn for this project. The thicker the yarn is, the less detail that you can fit in. So I knew not long after exploring this idea that I was probably looking at fingering weight yarn. But the theme, what could I possibly want to knit that would speak to me enough to warrant knitting an entire intarsia sweater? I could have gone with anything, but I didn't want it to be just anything. It had to be meaningful to me, it had to look amazing in a large illustrated format, and it had to be something that I was basically willing to suffer knitting through, because let's be honest, it is no cakewalk knitting an intarsia sweater in fingering weight yarn. There was only one thing that kept calling me, and that was something from my childhood that set off a love for a genre for my whole life. So much so that it even has a dedicated area in my sewing space, my department of mysteries. This is sort of my department of mysteries because I love mysteries, which I showed in my sewing room tour video. I'll link that in the description. And that was Nancy Drew. I have loved Nancy Drew books ever since I was a kid. I used to buy the vintage hardcover books at the thrift store. I have several of them in my sewing area, in fact. And over last Christmas, I got the rest of my Nancy Drew books from my mom and stepdad's house, although I still have to figure out where I'm going to put them. I even used Nancy Drew book cover fabric for the lining for one of my 1950s coats that was in my top three coats video. I'll link that video in the description too. The edition of books that I mostly had as a kid were the yellow spine ones like this that were published between 1959 and 1978. What I had in mind originally for the sweater was using the end papers as inspiration, and those are the designs that you find in the front and back covers on the inside. They're basically more simplified versions of the cover art, but in monotone, and that was generally my starting point. And then I had to decide which cover and from which editions I decided pretty much right away that it should be a cover from the editions that I collected, so the yellow spine ones. I spent a ton of time on the Nancy Drew Sleuth website, which by the way is a fantastic resource. It has every cover art and every variation between editions. It's amazing. Highly recommended if you're a Nancy Drew fan or if you just like vintage book illustrations. Anyway, as I thought about the idea more, I periodically scanned the cover and threw it into Photoshop and just kind of like tinkered around with it. It was all sloppy and kind of funky for a while while I was playing with things and trying to figure out what I need to do to get this off the ground. And then I had to decide, did I want to do a cover with Nancy only or did I want to do a cover with Nancy and her two best friends, Bess and George? And of course, me being me, I decided let's make it twice as epic and do two covers, one of each. And yes, that means if this story is new to you, I did the back too. And that was the point where I decided to scrap my original idea of only doing a very scaled down color palette because I was clearly not gonna be able to knit a sweater that had a design with Nancy Bass and George on it and not make Nancy a redhead, Bass a blonde, and George a brunette. But I did decide to still try to keep the color palette fairly minimal 
still emulating those vintage sweaters that I was originally inspired by. Pretty early on, I landed on Quest of the Missing Map for one of my covers because I've always been obsessed with maps and because that was one of my favorite Nancy Drew books as a kid. So that was my cover with all three girls. And then I decided on Clue of the Black Keys for the book cover with just Nancy. Although admittedly, I don't really remember exactly why I went with this one, although I think I just thought it was a doable cover. And I like that both of the arts had kind of a travel and sort of treasure hunting vibe. So the next question was, what do I do now to actually design all of this in Intarsha so that I can knit it? I knew it wasn't going to be as simple as simply scanning the cover art and distilling it down to the number of colors that I wanted to use. You don't really think about it at first, but there's a lot more going on in the background of these book cover illustrations. There was lots of digital cleanup that I had to do for both of these book covers so that the illustrations stood on their own against a plain knitted background. Quest of the Missing Map was actually a bit easier because the cover had a magenta background with the girls' heads and the map sort of hovering in the middle of the cover, but even still I had to define some kind of border around them because the background was not going to be magenta. But I put the cover art into Photoshop and started playing around with sort of drawing a wavy edge around the middle of that artwork to kind of frame it against a plain knitted background. And then in Photoshop, I started trying to limit the colors a little bit more and doing a load of freehand work, cleaning up corners and edges and trying to make basically more defined lines in the areas that were a little bit more subtle in the illustrations. And for the Quest of the Missing Map illustration, I also had to draw in a shirt for Nancy because in the original cover, her shirt kind of blends into the background. So obviously I wasn't going to be able to do that in knitting. Periodically at that point, I was debating what am I going to put above the cover art illustrations and I wasn't really sure. But in some of these preliminary photos, you can see I was playing around with different things like writing Nancy Drew and putting a magnifying glass. But once I felt loosely satisfied with the cover art in Photoshop, which was still very, very rough at this point, I brought it into Stitch Fiddle. Now Stitch Fiddle is an online charting app for knitting and embroidery and it was an amazing help for turning my modified illustrations into a chart. I highly recommend it. You can import an image and in the process you can determine what scale you'd like so you can figure out how much detail you're going to lose for the chart that it creates for you at the end. But the beauty is it's not a one and done thing. As soon as you import the chart, you can edit it and edit it. I did. I spent dozens and dozens of hours probably editing these charts. And one of the best things I found about Stitch Fiddle for my purposes is that you can limit the number of colors used in the chart, which was fantastic for me trying to achieve the somewhat scaled down limited color palette. So if you have say 15 or even 30 shades of green because you've got a ton going on in the background of one of your illustrations, you can distill that down to one shade of green. And in the end, I was satisfied with getting everything down to nine colors, and that included the light green background color and the dark green contrast color by playing with this all in Stitch Fiddle. But even when I got the color palette narrowed down in the chart, I still spent hours and hours in Stitch Fiddle, changing probably hundreds and hundreds of pixels and drawing lines in to define things even better, even more so than what I was able to accomplish in Photoshop. You can even see the progression in these three photos that I put together at the time that I was knitting this. The original cover and two iterations of my chart, which weren't even close to the final chart. There was a lot of phases of this. Some of the things that I had to change were things like on the cover of the Quest of the Missing Map, you can just make out a few letters, but they disappeared along all the various digital iterations that I was working on, so I had to add them back to the actual chart. I thought that the Clue of the Black Keys cover was going to be theoretically a little bit easier because it was mainly dealing with a bunch of foliage, but that was the entire cover and so when I started working on it, it was just kind of a mush of green with this limited color palette I was using. And it turned out that everything non-foliage related ended up being pretty muddy too, so for areas like the treasure chest and Nancy's shirt, I had to add in a heavy black outline to distinguish them from the background. So for that chart, I had to do a ton of work to define all the edges of the trees and shrubs and in some case add more in because Nancy is off to the far right side on the cover and that doesn't really lend itself to being in the center of a sweater. 
What I'm basically saying is I added a bunch of trees and shrubs that weren't in the original cover. Some were ones I found with random clip art and some I drew myself. Remember when I said I wasn't sure what I wanted to put above the illustrations of the sweater? Well, obviously I decided to be simple and just go with the titles. I realize simple is a relative term here. The titles were easier than everything else, and I went with the same dark green contrast color that I was gonna use for all of the ribbing. For those with keen eyes, I actually used the titles from the 1930s and 40s editions instead of from the yellow spine editions, just cause I liked the font better. I thought that it looked more interesting than the all caps titles on the yellow spine editions that I used for the illustrations. Those were cleaned up in Stitch Fiddle in the exact same way, bringing them down to just one color for the text and of course, many, many hours of cleanup. Speaking of which, I estimated that I probably spent at least 60 hours designing these charts and then I still had to knit the sweater. I mentioned earlier that I knit this in fingering weight yarn and I went with the Shetland wool because I knew it would stick together beautifully in the intarsia. I knit this in Jameson's Shetland Spindrift. The gauge was seven and a half stitches an inch, which is a tighter gauge than I usually knit garments, but a pretty common one for vintage knitting patterns. So that means that that gauge with this big of illustrations, my charts were 122 stitches wide. One was 140 rows tall. The other was 160 rows tall. Both titles were 50 rows tall. That's approximately 40,000 stitches in intarsia. I will let you just sit here for a second and contemplate that. Now I tend to use my iPad for knitting charts, but that was definitely out of the window with a chart 122 stitches wide. So I actually printed the charts and they were so wide I had to tape them together. And of course I saved all of my charts from this project. Knitting the sweater was, well, I think I summarized it best in a blog post I wrote in 2018. It was both satisfying and terrible. At most, I had 15 bobbins going at a time. It was slow work, but I wove in my ends every few inches. There was no way I was gonna weave in that many ends at the end of the sweater. So I'm so glad that I did it as I went. But you can see it looks cool even from the inside of the work too. And after about a month, I finished knitting the front. And I actually built myself in a contingency plan because I didn't know if I'd hate knitting the intarsia so much that I wouldn't want to do the design on the back. So I used my favorite book cover on the front just in case I opted to not do the back. But I powered through the back and I did both. And the back was done in about another month after the front. It felt epic to finally finish the front and the back. It was so exciting on the back when I was knitting the last few rows of the title and I was like, I've really done this. <laughs> At that point, I did still have to seam it and knit the sleeves and the neckband, but that was a breeze and a welcome relief after knitting nothing but intarsia for two months. Now I said this earlier, but this Nancy Drew sweater was my Rhinebeck sweater for 2017. If you're not familiar, Rhinebeck is the New York Sheep and Wool Festival, which is held in a beautiful part of upstate New York every mid-October. And I finished with one week to spare. A lot of knitters who attend knit a Rhinebeck sweater and that's what they wear there and that's where I debuted my Nancy Drew sweater. I had a girls weekend at Rhinebeck with my mom who was vending at the Indian Untangled Trunk Show and my best friend all the way back from college. She and I walked around together and early on in the day on Saturday when I was wearing my Nancy Drew sweater, she started to keep a tally of people who came up to talk to me about it and I think at the end of the day we were at about 70. I even talked briefly that day on Christy Glass's Tell Me About Your Rhinebeck Sweater video. I'll link that YouTube video in the description. My friend Sydney, who runs Squid's Vintage School of Knitting on Patreon, and I were walking around and we talked about our sweaters on Christy's video. Admittedly, in that video, it was towards the end of the day and I don't think I had anything left to say about the sweater at all because I had talked to so many people about it. But it really was an amazing, albeit exhausting, feeling to get to share the joy of knitting the sweater with so many knitters. It was such a great experience designing and knitting such a special sweater and I still feel so proud for what I was able to accomplish with this project. And this project was so much more than knitting a sweater. It was basically like a love letter to myself. It wasn't created and designed for others and please don't ask if I'll ever share the charts or turn this into a design because this was for me only. It was just a wild project that I created purely for myself and for the joy of turning this weird dream project into reality. So hey, don't be afraid to pursue your wildest project fantasies, even if it's a lifetime of intarsia in one sweater.
please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Until next time, happy knitting, unless you're knitting in Tarsha, in which case you have my deepest sympathies because I've been there. Bye.